Good afternoon. My name is Mike Willett at the Intertribal Council of Michigan's National Native Network. Welcome to the NNN webinar series on cancer risk reduction in Indian Country. This webinar is titled Nicotine Secession Services Access Workgroup Introduction and Update. This technical assistance webinar is being hosted by the National Native Network with the Indian Health Service Health and Disease Prevention, which offers technical assistance and resources for commercial tobacco prevention and control throughout Indian Country and with the Indian Health Service Clinical Support Center. Your presenter today is Commander Michael Verdugo, Bemidji Area Pharmacy Clinical Applications Coordinator at the IHS Bemidji Area Office. Commander Verdugo has a doctor in pharmacy from the University of the, of the Pacific School of Pharmacy from 1999 and a master in science from the Grand Canyon University in Phoenix, Arizona in addiction counseling in 2017. Commander Verdugo is a residing trained clinical pharmacist with over 17 years experience working with patients with tobacco use disorders. He has served as lead for the United States Public Health Service Nicotine Services Access Work Group since 2017 and was co-lead from 2015 through 2017. He has directed tobacco secession trainings and certifications to numerous health and health-related professionals since 2001. We're pleased to offer continuing education credits for participants in this webinar. No commercial interest support was used to fund this activity. This activity is designated one con contact hour for nurses. And to obtain a certificate of continuing education, you must be registered for the course, participate in the webinar in its entirety, and submit a completed post-webinar survey. By the end of this webinar, participants will be able to examine available resources offered by the NCSAW to reduce tobacco dependence, discuss how information on tobacco secession efforts can be better shared and partnerships explored amongst stakeholders, and facilitate collaboration between IT and U sites and NCSAW to enhance capacity to deliver evidence-based nicotine treatment and prevention interventions. If you have any questions, feel free to type your questions into the question box at the lower right-hand side of your screen. Questions will be answered during the last few minutes of the webinar. And now I give you at this time, Commander Verdugo. Thank you so much, Mike. I appreciate that introduction. And thank you to the National Native Network, as well as the Indian Health Services Health Promotion and Disease Prevention Program for this opportunity to share about the Nicotine Cessation Services Access Work Group, who we are, what we've been working on, and to hopefully open up a dialogue about how we can partner with uh, federal, tribal, and urban Indian programs to help reduce uh, the prevalence rates of tobacco use and nicotine addiction within our nation. So with that, I'll uh, go ahead and move on to the disclaimer uh, that the views and opinions presented in this presentation are those of myself as the presenter and do not necessarily represent those of the government of the United States, Department of Health and Human Services, the Public Health Service, the Office of the Surgeon General, or the Indian Health Service. So feel free to hurl virtual tomatoes at me uh, if you disagree or don't like anything I say. All right. Our objectives uh, were previously covered by Mike. Thank you for that. And so we'll move right on into the first slide, which is what is the purpose of the Nicotine Cessation Services Access Work Group? Well, we exist to support the implementation of evidence-based nicotine cessation treatment services nationally in accordance with the United States Surgeon General's number one priority, which is the elimination of tobacco. And I will uh, clarify that as commercial tobacco and nicotine use in our country. And so we exist to help to support uh, stakeholders, which include um, tribal and urban Indian organizations, all the way down to frontline uh, health and health-related providers 
within clinics and communities to address commercial tobacco use and nicotine addiction, addiction in native communities. So let's take a step back in time and talk a little bit about well, why is this important? Why is it important to be engaged in addressing commercial tobacco use and nicotine addiction in our country? Uh, so we'll, we'll get into our time machine and go back to 1964. And in 1964, there was that was the uh, Surgeon General uh, Luther Terry produced the groundbreaking report, Smoking and Health. It was the first Surgeon General's response report on the health impacts of smoking. And 50 years later in 2014, the Office of Surgeon General gave an update on the health consequences of smoking in the ensuing 50 years. And a lot has changed in our, our society and our culture over 50 years. I, I, attitudes about smoking changed dramatically but also the science surrounding the health consequences of commercial tobacco use has changed dramatically during that period. And so what was the smoking prevalence back in the 60s? Well, amazingly, in 1965, a year after the report, on the average, 42% of Americans smoked. So just over two out of every five Americans. And many of you might have participated in, in other presentations or, or seen some of the ads that used to exist uh, that were found in uh, magazines and periodicals and, and things in our, in our country that even had healthcare providers. Uh, Chesterfield cigarettes, the cigarette your doctor recommends. And so we, we've seen some tremendous changes in the ensuing years and just in our societal attitudes about commercial tobacco. And, and in 2012, the tobacco prevalence rate for the nation dropped from 42% down to 18%. So now less than one out of five uh, are smoking. But despite the overall decline, there remains disparities in, the, in tobacco use, commercial tobacco use rates across the country, according to the region of the United States that we're looking at. So typically in the Midwest of the United States has a higher uh, smoking prevalence rate than say the West Coast or the Southwest of the United States. There are still disparities related to education level uh, as we there's clear data that links higher tobacco prevalent use rates, commercial tobacco use rates uh, for people that have uh, less than a high, high school education. Uh, certainly there are racial and ethnic disparities in tobacco use rates and this is particularly important when we're thinking about addressing commercial tobacco use and nicotine addiction in uh, Native American and Alaska Native communities because the, that population, our population that we work with every day has the highest tobacco use prevalence rates. Finally, socioeconomic status also plays, plays a role with uh, the poorest of Americans often having the highest tobacco, commercial tobacco use rates. And with the price of cigarettes, the ripple effects of, of tobacco use amongst our poorest Americans um, really can be economically catastrophic. The majority of, um, of smokers begin by age 18, 87%. And by 26, the age of 26, we have almost 100% of people who, who, if they are going to smoke, do so by the age of 26. So that tells us that we need to never lose sight of prevention efforts and even treatment efforts geared towards the youth. Because if people start smoking early, they're more likely to persist. And if we can prevent them from smoking as in their teens and early 20s, then they are highly unlikely to go on to use commercial tobacco uh, in a later point in their life. We just had some recent data come out from the Centers from, for Disease Control uh, just this month that looked at tobacco prevalence rates in 2016. And the good news is that from 2005 
down to 2016, we continue to see declines overall in our country in tobacco prevalence rates down to 15.5%. That's an even improvement from the 2012 data from the Surgeon General's uh, report update in 2014. Uh, but we're seeing that um, we're still above the Healthy People 2020 goal. And folks, we're already in 2018, and the 2020 goal is less than or equal to 12% tobacco prevalence rate. And so we still have some room to go uh, for the nation as a whole. So rates are highest amongst those without a high school diploma, and that includes those with a GED, as I mentioned before. And again, the pot, looking at socioeconomic level, one out of sport, four smokers live before the poverty level. And so they are, of course, at, experience the greatest economic impact from the cost of cigarettes. The highest rate is actually found amongst uninsured and those on public forms of health insurance. I've seen rates in the Medicaid population of approaching one out of three Medicaid recipients are commercial tobacco users. People with another group of Americans that experience a rather high tobacco prevalence rate are those with psychological distress and um, mental health disorders with rates approaching 35, one out of three, uh, compared to those with no distress, uh, we're, we're seeing that below our overall prevalence rate of around 15%. So in this was all data from the report that came out this month, and the CDC's Office on Smoking and Health provided some of the following uh, closing recommendations that targeted interventions that are warranted to reach these high prevalence subpopulations uh, could result in substantial reductions in the disease burden from commercial tobacco use and death, lost productivity, as well as reductions in uh, medical costs due to use. And that providing barrier-free access to tobacco cessation medications and counseling are essential components of helping to implement evidence-based interventions to reduce these prevalence rates. So it's giving us some a call to action. So let's apply that to Native communities. So the data for Native, Native Americans uh, is as follows. There is a report that came out towards um, the end of the year last year looking at prevalence rates amongst American Indian and Alaskan Natives. And from 2010 to 2015, um, we saw a 43.3% rate overall. That's look th That approximates the tobacco prevalence rate for the country as a whole back in 1965. So that is that is alarming. And when we look at the different types of tobacco, commercial tobacco, 37% uh, for cigarettes, 6.6% .6 for smokeless tobacco, which includes chew tobacco, for all demographic categories amongst Alaska Native and American Indians, except for those who had a college education. They actually did, uh, Native Americans with college educations did not have a higher prevalence rate than the population, the general population or the majority population. Amongst American Indian and Indians and Alaska Natives, it was the prevalence rate is noted to be highest amongst males, uh, younger cohorts, and again, that association with the degree of education, socioeconomic status, and interestingly, those who had never been married have the highest rates. So according to the CDC report, they recommended that culturally informed strategies are integral to effectively addressing tobacco prevalence rates amongst American Indian and Alaskan Native communities. And such intervention should include engaging traditional healers and elders in communities, fostering respect for traditional tobacco use, and 
looking at the other social determinants of health that impact Native communities and working to create partnerships with American Indian and Alaskan Native communities to work together to address the scourge of commercial tobacco use in Native communities. So nicotine, and what is nicotine's role in this? Because again, we, we started out as the Tobacco Cessation Services Access Work Group, but in 2017, we voted on a change to nicotine cessation because really the issue isn't tobacco per se, it's the ingredients in tobacco, namely nicotine, which is addictive, which reinforces its use. And so when did nicotine become known as the source of the addictiveness of commercial tobacco products? Well, that was first published in a report from the Office of the Surgeon General in 1988. And today we see uh, the use of electronic nicotine delivery systems, uh, abbreviated as ENDS, which are also known as electronic cigarettes, now are emerging in our youth as the most commonly form, used form of nicotine products, eclipsing that of tobacco products, commercial tobacco products amongst our youth. Shockingly, from 2011 to 2015, there was a 900% increase amongst high school students in the use of electronic nicotine delivery systems. And it has been noted that e-cigarette use is greater in males amongst whites and Hispanics and lowest amongst African Americans and those with a college education. Also startling is the fact that electronic nicotine delivery systems, which are really drug delivery systems, can also be used to deliver other substances such as cannabinoids, which are the active ingredients in marijuana and related products, as well as other illicit drugs. And so you create a vehicle that not only can you deliver nicotine as an addictive substance, but that could be combined with or alternatively be used to deliver other highly addictive substances. So what are some of the effects of nicotine? Well, looking at its impact on adolescents and adolescent brain development, the alterations that nicotine produces to the developing brain of an adolescent can actually kindle or uh, prime the brain to be susceptible to addictions of other types. So primes the pump, so to speak, and you know, we've many of us have heard of this idea of of uh, tobacco being a gateway drug, and there's act actually a, a, a neurological basis for that, because nicotine, as it stimulates the reward pathways of the brain, actually, uh, in a sense, can begin to hardwire and increase the sensitivity of these pathways, so that whether it's nicotine that's stimulating it, or alcohol, or some other illicit substance in adolescents that use it, then they have uh, struggle um, in a much greater fashion uh, with um, resisting the urge to use. In a, a developing uh, child in the womb, nicotine does cross the placenta. It increases the risk of sudden infant death syndrome and could cause alternate alterations in the anatomy and the development of the brain as well as causing problems in auditory processing and increases the risk for obesity. Many people don't realize that nicotine in and of itself can lead to uh, insulin resistance and we find insulin resistance in, in obese patients. So there's likely a, a, a biological basis for that increased risk of obesity in, in children born to mothers of nicotine users. And this could be users of tobacco, commercial tobacco products or electronic nicotine delivery systems. The other aspect of electronic nicotine delivery systems that people don't often consider is the fact that nicotine itself is dissolved in things like propylene glycol 
such as antifreeze or glycerin or, or other fats. Uh, and so these, these get aerolized, these, these substances get aerosolized right along with the nicotine and get inhaled into people's lungs, leading to many health consequences. And even the clouds that are produced after uh, vaping or the use of these electronic nicotine delivery systems themselves contain a substantial amount of nicotine. So, so they're not innocuous, the so-called vape clouds that are produced. They contain nicotine and many of these other substances that are used to vaporize the nicotine and could have harmful effects even, on, even by themselves. And we're, we're, we're beginning to learn more and more about what those health consequences are. And hopefully we'll uh, be able to approach the, the degree of robustness of data that we have that shows that second and third hand commercial tobacco smoke can cause on people's health. Okay, so that was some of the scientific and the why, the background. So moving into who we are as the Nicotine Cessation Services Access Work Group and what are our goals? Well, our first goal is to increase access to evidence-based nicotine cessation services. And increasing access includes the agencies of the public health service, such as the Indian Health Service, other federal health partners, such as the Department of Veterans Affairs and the Defense Health Administration, as well as the private sector. We're all in this together. The, our, our, this, our second goal is to produce tools to develop or optimize nicotine cessation and prevention services. So to help connect stakeholders with the evidence-based tools, materials, experience and expertise uh, from our work group to help support them in either creating nicotine cessation and prevention services or taking their existing services and optimizing them. We also aim to disseminate resources to make nicotine cessation and prevention programs financially independent and sustainable. Standing up any program costs money and so one of our aims is to help identify uh, resources to optimize the ability to bill for the delivery of nicotine cessation services or to identify funding opportunities to help support the development and optimization of cessation and prevention programs. We also aim to build a consultative support community a, so that sites and stakeholders can turn to, can come and to collaborate with us. So we can share ideas and we can provide uh, guidance on ways that they can implement and optimize their cessation and prevention services. And finally, to report our work group activities to the Office of Surgeon General in support of the priority to eliminate tobacco and nicotine use in our nation. So looking a little deeper at how the Surgeon General's 50 years of progress report aligns with our goals, the applicable goals uh, that came out of that report in 2014 to our work are to support the provision of access to proven nicotine cessation treatment to all users, especially those with significant mental and physical morbid comorbidities expanding nicotine cessation for all users in primary and specialty healthcare settings. So that includes our primary care clinics, our specialty clinics. It also includes our behavioral health clinics, especially when we think about the high prevalence rate amongst Americans that have struggle with mental health issues as well as increasing the implementation and utilization of evidence-based tobacco control interventions. I've heard it once said that it can take up to 17 years for a clinical practice guideline to actually permeate into and be incorporated into the standard of practice. And so we want to be about partnering with our stakeholders to accelerate that because 
of the dire consequences of not acting. The 13th Surgeon General of the United States, many of you, uh, if you were around in the 80s, might remember C. Everett Koop. He was a very visible Surgeon General. And one of his quotes was that, we need to make it as easy to get treatment as it is to get tobacco. And for us, that's a, that's a, a rallying cry, is that if we can make it as easy to get treatment for commercial tobacco use and nicotine addiction as it is to get tobacco, then we can really make a dent in our tobacco prevalence rates throughout the nation. So how can we get this done? Well, what are some of the changes and, and things that are going on within the healthcare space, particularly in the federal healthcare space, to make getting treatment as easy as it is to get commercial tobacco? Well, there's at least 24 federal Indian Health Service tobacco cessation clinics across the country. And that is um, data from last year. There perhaps are more in that doesn't necessarily take into consideration all of the work that's done in our by our tribal health programs, mental health programs, and urban Indian health programs. The Affordable Care Act also mandated the coverage of tobacco cessation counseling and pharmacotherapy for pregnant women who are Medicaid recipients. So that made it, mandated a change to state Medicaid programs, the Affordable Care Act. And the Affordable Care Act also requires the provision of medically necessary tobacco treatment services for children and adolescents. And so two of our, our very top priority groups, pregnant women and our youth, under the Affordable Care Act and through uh, Medicaid benefits, if they have that, have, should have access to covered treatments. As of January of 2014, tobacco cessation drugs were no longer considered an excludable benefit. They were uh, considered uh, by CMS as, uh, as therapies that were considered to be uh, essential and therefore needed to be included on state uh, Medicaid formu drug formularies. Counseling services may be covered under a variety of different benefits and there are numerous different provider categories that are recognized as qualified providers of tobacco, commercial tobacco and nicotine addiction services, and they include physicians, pharmacists, dietitians, mental health counselors, um, nurses can go on there, as well as prevention professionals. And states are also permitted to obtain up to 50% federal med Medicaid matching funds to help them establish and operate quit lines as well. So the Affordable Care Act brought to bear a lot of additional uh, authorizations to enable state Medicaid programs to address the high tobacco prevalence rates amongst Medicaid recipient populations. So who is on the Nicotine Cessation Services Access Workgroup? Our executive sponsor is Rear Admiral Pam Schweitzer. She is the current Chief Professional Officer of the Pharmacists within the Public Health Service, and Captain Megan War is a pharmacist and the Chief of Pharmacy at the Phoenix Indian Medical Center. She's our Chief Subject Matter Expert and is uh, the former lead for the Indian Health Service's Tobacco Control uh, Task Force that was in existence throughout much of the 2000s. Uh, Ms. Alberta Vicente, who is the headquarters lead for the health promotion and disease prevention program for the Indian Health Service, is one of our leadership advisors. Myself and Commander Jing Li, uh, another pharmacist from the Phoenix Indian Medical Center, were the, the leads for NICSA, and Commander Danielle Dadana from the FDA, and Lieutenant Kristen Almaris is our uh, secretary and ex Assistant Executive Secretary, respectively. Now into our subgroups. And so Training Resources subgroup, led by Commander Solis and Lieutenant Tuckett, they are charged for increasing access to evidence-based training resources for equipping 
staff to be able to address commercial tobacco and nicotine addiction. And so many of you might have heard the, of the Rx for Change program, and that is actually a product of the labors of the training resources subgroup. And in the last few years, they've had an increasingly broad impact in getting people uh, access to no cost, basic tobacco cessation intervention skills that are aligned with the US Public Health Service guidelines. Moving on to documentation and informatics, uh, we have Commander Atkinson and Lieutenant Commander Haney. And they are tasked with developing documentation tools and uh, reminders and other modifications to uh, electronic health records so that you can leverage technology to provide evidence-based interventions, to track those interventions, and to also successfully obtain reimbursement for the interventions that you're delivering. The Metrics and Outcomes Work Group, led by Commander Lee and Commander Patel, focus on looking at what are the impact of our interventions? What are the prevalence rates? How are those being uh, addressed in light of the interventions that are being deployed out in the field? Provider resources that's led by Commanders Bayer Grosselin and Digala develop resources for providers of all types to be equipped with the tools that they need to successfully deliver services, to document them, to be recognized by state Medicaid programs, and ultimately to successfully obtain reimbursement for their activities so that tobacco cessation, commercial tobacco cessation services are sustainable in clinics and health programs and mental health programs where they're delivered. Our communication subgroup, from Captain Lau is our lead, aims to facilitate the dissemination of information about um, evidence-based resources, activities of our work group, and connecting those with our stakeholders. Our funding resources group is uh, led by Commanders Robinson and Addison, and they are ch charged with identifying funding resources for our partners and stakeholders to develop, to expand, optimize their nicotine cessation and prevention activities. Last but not least is our prevention resources subgroup, our newest subgroup led by Commanders Burt and Lieutenant Commander Quadio, and they are tasked with developing, disseminating, and adapting prevention resources for sites that are delivering nicotine cessation uh, prevention interventions. So looking at the structure, uh, we've got our work groups there and just gives you a visual picture of how we're all connected. And again, many of us are uh, working within the Indian Health Service, but we do have representation from other agencies such as CMS and the FDA, as well as the Office of Surgeon General. So here's what we've done. So we kicked off our work back in the fall of 2015 with a survey. We disseminated a survey out to federal facilities from at 40 different sites within the Indian Health Service, as well as sites within the Coast Guard. And what we discovered is that based on the responses we got, over 50% of facilities do not have trained tobacco treatment specialists, and over 75% do not have certified tobacco cessation instructors. And so this was part of what created the impetus to help push forward evidence-based training resources, such as the ARCS for Change program, to equip people working in communities to be able to deliver evidence-based interventions. The ARCS for Change Tobacco Cessation Training has, has been a partnership with the University of California, San Francisco, Purdue University, and our training resources subgroup. What they do is they offer free online 5A's based 
which are consistent with the U.S. Public Health Service's guidelines on brief interventions, as well as an abbreviated version of the ask, advise, refer interventions at no cost to anyone who would like to access that, as well as providing a virtual or, in some cases, live skills demonstration to su supplement and augment the online content that people are able to review and internalize to give them the opportunity to apply the knowledge that they have uh, gained so that they're more confident to go out and deliver these interventions when working with patients and clients. And included in that is, is the ask that people who complete this training uh, are willing to agree to a smoke-free pledge. Completion is of this program is recognized by the University of Arizona as a prerequisite to be able to uh, participate in their tobacco treatment specialist. And so we're grateful for the University of Arizona for their willingness to partner uh, with us by recognizing that as, as a qualification in order to go that next step and get trained and certified to become a tobacco treatment specialist. And I've included the website for our Rx for Change uh, program on that on the slide. We've also gotten involved in the Great American Smoke Out, uh, which is um, an activity that the American Cancer Society does every year. And in 2016, our work group uh, had a special subcommittee that was successful in w working with uh, interested healthcare providers across the country to contact over a thousand individuals across 11 different sites and in nine different operating divisions within the public health service. They were successful in identifying 61 people who were willing to quit and 37 actually pledged to quit within the next 30 days as the result of that outreach done just on, again, on one day, the Great American Smokeout. We had five individuals request changing, request more information on about how to get the Rx for Change training, and overall, our that outreach for 2016 involved 30 public health service officers, 26 civil servants, and a total of 53 hours of event time. Well, in 2017, uh, we continued our activity, and we're actually able to broaden the number of people that enhance, increase the number of people that are indicating a desire to quit, providing pledges, and receiving or requesting resources from our work group. And we also began tracking social media posts, shares, and, and views as a result of our activity. So we believe this is a valuable outreach and intend to continue to engage in great American smokeout activities and would welcome partnerships from other uh, interested stakeholders on our activities in coming years. We've also been able to engage the Health Occupation Student Organization, HOSA. HOSA is an organization that is geared towards providing high school and undergraduate students with the opportunity to learn more about careers within the health professions and health related professions, and giving them opportunities to receive mentoring and engage in uh, scholarly activities to increase their competence and their preparedness to enter the health professions. And in 2016, we were able to successfully participate in the training of 54 students in, from that organization and the Rx for Change training we did at the Association for Military Surgeons in the United States meeting. And in 2017, we again had the opportunity to train twice, over twice the number of students and state advisors at the AMSIS meeting, as well as receiving an invitation to attend the uh, International Leadership Conference that HOSA puts on in, it was in Orlando this past year. And in the coming years, we see uh, increased opportunity to collaborate with HOSA state chapters, 
Uh, the leadership of HOSA nationally is, has uh, charged us with or challenged us to help them get all over, over all more than the 225,000 or so more students that participate in their organization across the country to get them all trained with the basic skills that they need to be able to deliver evidence-based nicotine cessation services. So the way that we're answering that call is partnering with the state organizations and we are beginning to have calls with those state organizations to develop plans to do so in earnest. We've also engaged an area tribal health board and did apply for funding for funding to help support a pilot project. That partnership was the, with the Great Lakes Intertribal Council to complete the application. And although we were not successful with that particular uh, funding announcement, we are um, continuing to look for opportunities to take the toolkit that we've been able to develop and to partner with tribal and urban Indian programs that are addressing commercial tobacco use in their communities to evaluate the translatability of evidence-based tools into communities using a community-based participatory research model, but also utilize those partnerships to help further culturally adapt and refine these evidence-based tools, thus maximizing their applicability and usability in Native communities. We have, looking at our different subgroups, we've been able to see impacts from our communication subgroup in their engagement with the HOSA uh, national events, as well as their uh, dissemination of marketing materials for the ARCS for Change program uh, in partnership with HOSA and COA, which is the Commission Officers Association, the professional organization for public health service officers. And the communication subgroup has also facilitated a Spanish language adaptation uh, in partnership with our training resources uh, for the ARCS for Change program, as well as a module for youth geared towards the use, uh, cessation surrounding the use of electronic cigarettes, as well as providing guidance for our work group charter. Our documentation and informatics work group was able to develop a YouTube training video on completing tobacco cessation screening and documentation activities within the Indian Health Services RPMS EHR, developed a SNOMED pick list for use within the RPMS EHR, as well as developed initial and follow-up uh, provider templates for use in documenting commercial tobacco cessation visits. Our funding resources group, again, worked in collaboration with the Great Lakes Intertribal Council in that funding announcement. Uh, and they've also uh, been working on a grant writing guidance tool for inclusion in our toolkit, as well as explored a grant from the American Medical Association as an additional source of funding. And they continue to survey the funding landscape for appropriate announcements that could be used for the partnership for our pilot project that we're hoping to find partners to do. Our metrics and outcomes subgroup was able to develop an access database for tracking metrics uh, for programs that are engaged in providing cessation and prevention services. Uh, just in the past couple of months, they've developed a uh, e-newsletter called Monthly Tobacco Trends that highlights some of the emerging data on nicotine and commercial tobacco use for the purposes of disseminating it to our partners and stakeholders. And we're also exploring the development of a listserv that stakeholder interested parties could subscribe to to get those tobacco trend updates. And then also develop some GIPRA measures uh, as part of a tool, the toolkit to help sites that are trying to meet the GIPRA-related measures surrounding commercial tobacco use. Our prevention resources subgroup has been involved in community outreach, and both of the leads have gotten uh, certified so that they can facilitate 
the discussion, uh, the training of other individuals to further equip more people to engage in tobacco interventions. And they'll be working more on specific training uh, resources that can be disseminated to our partners and stakeholders. Provider resources, I've uh, been focusing on developing uh, tools necessary to develop, to provide a, a toolkit to here, here's everything you might need to develop a successful cessation clinic, including documentation and sample credentialing privileging documents for providers that would be delivering the services. We've completed work on a 50 state Medicaid guide that lists the common core documentation elements as well as uh, the types of providers that are recognized by that particular state Medicaid program as being uh, authorized to receive reimbursement for delivering cessation services as well as uh, provided recommendations and guidance for uh, maintaining your clinical currency in the field of tobacco cessation, commercial tobacco cessation, uh, by identifying some lists of providers of continuing education. And finally, training resources and through their partnership with UCSF and Purdue in by way of the Arcs for Change program has facilitated the training over five, of over 500 individuals in the last couple of years. And they've also developed a recognition program to recognize individuals who not just complete the training, but actually use the training they've received to go on and to treat and train others. So looking to the future, what we're planning is uh, to finalize and to share the toolkit that we've been working on. And we've also, we would also like to engage in a pilot study that we've entitled Alliance of Stakeholders for the Engagement of Communities to Minimize Commercial Tobacco Acceptance and Accessibility, ASIMA, which is the uh, Anishinaabe word for tobacco, uh, as, as a way, again, to evaluate the applicability of existing evidence-based tools and to ad further adapt them to enhance their utility in uh, high prevalence communities. We'll continue to partner with our Health Occupation Student Association partners. We've we're been in talks with the Department of Veterans Affairs to develop a shared platform for uh, increasing the accessibility of evidence-based training um, at no cost with CE accreditation uh, through a shared platform with Department of Veterans Affairs. And as I mentioned, we're working on a listserv to disseminate information. So in closing, what's the ask? Well, the ask from us as the Nicotine Cessation Services Access Work Group is to learn more about how we can support you and your community's efforts to in increase access to culturally appropriate treatment for commercial tobacco use and nicotine addiction. Help us to, to partner with you to identify what are the gaps in translating the evidence-based practice guidelines and tools that are out there to make them more applicable within your facilities and communities. Help us to learn more about how we can collaborate with each other to truly realize Surgeon General Coop's vision for making treatment for nicotine addiction as easy as it is to get nicotine products. And finally, to learn more about how we can facilitate the sharing of information, not only about the emerging data surrounding nicotine addiction and its treatment or what evidence-based practices are working, but also to share ideas amongst programs that are successful with other programs to, you know, in a sense, be a connector uh, to connect good, good practices, best practices uh, with other entities uh, within Native communities and across the nation. So the contacts for our work group, there's my contact information, uh, my email address, uh, as well as phone number for myself, as well as our uh, co-chair, Commander Jing Lee. And that is the conclusion of the presentation. I'll uh, entertain any questions. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Commander Verdugo. Um, again, just to remind everybody that we'll go ahead and uh, take questions through the uh, question uh, box on the lower right corner of your screen. If you'd like to go ahead and type in your questions, I'll ask it aloud for everybody to hear. And um, Commander Verdugo can go ahead and uh, get those answered. In the meantime, while folks are plugging in their questions, uh, we'll go ahead and remind folks that um, they can visit the National Native Network online at keepitsacred.org. And you can also follow us on social media at facebook.com slash keepitsacred, uh, Twitter at keepitsacred, and LinkedIn slash company slash keepitsacred, linkedin.com slash company slash keepitsacred. So uh, with that, we'll go ahead and get started on some questions here. Um, this person says, uh, I see it as 43.3% prevalence overall. Are there pre prevalence rates adjusted by IHS area? That data, the 43% was CDC data. And I know we've... Um, trying to get a, a current update on IHS data uh, for our own internal purposes. And uh, so I don't have that down uh, at the IHS area by area uh, level. Our, our last uh, snapshot of that, uh, which was a year or two ago, showed that um, the Bemidji area, the Great Plains area, and the Nashville area at the time had the highest tobacco prevalence rates amongst the other areas. And then this person here says, uh, what does the staff look like at the tobacco secession clinics? So that, that can vary. Um, within the Indian Health Service, oftentimes the providers of the tobacco cessation clinics are pharmacists. Um, that is uh, nice from the standpoint that you can receive the counseling and the medication from the pharmacist and in one location, and that uh, oftentimes frees up busy providers uh, from having to have a specific visit just for tobacco cessation. But frankly, the literature shows that a, a variety of different provider types can be successful in delivering evidence-based tobacco, commercial tobacco cessation services, and that can range from nurses to dietitians to health educators to uh, mid-level and uh, other medical and physician providers. And then this person asks if you can provide the link to the YouTube training video on tobacco secession and visit documentation. Mike, is that something that I could uh, email to you and that could get pushed out to the participants or what's the best way to, to handle um, that? I'd be happy to. Sure. Um, yeah, what I could do is I could, if you could email that to me, I can get that put onto the webinar archive page and where all the resources will be available um, for this webinar, including the video recording of this webinar. Um, we can also add on the uh, YouTube video um, as well, if that's okay with you. Outstanding. Yeah, so I'll get that to you. So we'll go ahead and uh, post that on keepitsacred.org and then look on the uh, webinar archive um, resource on the left side of the page there. And um, you'll look for uh, Commander Verdugo's presentation from today. And uh, we'll go ahead and have that uh, YouTube link um, shared right there. Um, this person says, who do we contact to get more information on your pilot project? So. Uh, interested uh, individuals are more than welcome to send an email to myself and uh, Jing Lee. Our, our information, our emails were there at the, on that last slide. Uh, shoot us an email and uh, we're glad to reach, follow back up with you and have a discussion about how we might be able to partner. And there's your email address right there. Thank you, sir. Um, this person says, what partners do you work with in Alaska? Uh, we currently don't have any formal partnerships with Alaska, although we do have uh, two individuals, uh, members of our uh, leadership that uh, work up in Alaska. Commander Mike Byer-Grosselin is at South Central Foundation, as well as Commander Renee Robinson. 
and uh, so but we're we're certainly open and welcome to working with the great people of Alaska as well. So please reach out to us if, if you're interested in partnering. Um, this person says, uh, I'm a service provider for quit lines. I know that you ask, I know that you ask uh, f was focused on hospitals, but do you see a space for the quit lines to support this work that you're doing with the NACSW? So I think that there's definitely an opportunity for us to um, become more aware of the quit lines that are available and especially quit lines that provide um, expertise and people have experience working with within native communities and addressing commercial tobacco use and and have um, a sense for how to highlight the uh, the valuable role that traditional tobacco can play and contrast that against commercial tobacco use so uh, i think there's there's a lot of space for for partnerships and, and greater awareness on our part about the great work that uh, quit lines might be doing in that regard as well as facilitating just general knowledge amongst our partners of of who all the quit line players are out there um, this person says, uh, what suggestions do you have for making state tobacco quit lines culturally responsive? Well, I, I think that, that uh, there's certainly an opportunity for perhaps training, uh, looking at training and how training is delivered to quit line staff and and taking a look at programs such as the University of Arizona's um, Basic Skills for Native Communities, uh, which was actually developed in partnership with uh, the Indian Health Services Tobacco Control Task Force. And so looking at, at resources such as that to ensure that uh, the staff on the quit lines have um, gotten that information and receive that training so that they can provide more culturally relevant intervention to American Indian and Alaska Native uh, clients who call. And then this person says, uh, how can members of non-federally recognized tribes intersect with your work? Well, um, we are open to working with with any partners and have, at this point are, are not restricted in only working with uh, federally recognized tribes. So we welcome any discussions with non-federally recognized or state recognized tribes. And then the next person said, is asking um, where they can find the slideshow for later. Um, the slideshow will be available on um, keepitsacred.org. So you're going to type in keepitsacred.org into your uh, web browser. And on the left-hand side, under the resource option on the menu, um, you'll see resources, and then you'll see webinar archive. And then we'll have that up uh, later on today to uh, go back and look through and check out the slides and uh, check out the YouTube video that uh, Commander Verdugo is going to send over to us today. Um, this person says, uh, do you currently have any tobacco secession presentations developed specifically for Native American and Alaska Native populations? So um, if we're talking about a, a presentation that could be delivered to a community-based um, audience, um, I'll have to go to my counterparts on our work on our committee, on our work group, and see if there's something that is already in process or been developed, but I think that's an excellent idea. And then this next person asks, are there templates available or PowerPoint presentation resources available to use to provide education? That is um, not something that we've currently thought about, but I think that's Again, another outstanding idea where you could potentially have a, a library of, of different templated presentations that have a lot of the evidence based and culturally appropriate information in there that people could access and modify for their use. So uh, I appreciate that comment. 
Um, this person asks, do you happen to know what specific neural alter alterations can happen in adolescence in regards to nicotine exposure? This is mentioned a lot, but not much depth is provided on the subject. I feel this would be a good educational opportunity to further educate youth. So the the mechanism of, of that that I'm aware of involves the um, stimulation of the reward center of the brain and the pathways uh, that lead into the reward center from the use of nicotine and its effects on the dopamine neurotransmitter system. So that, that's, that's my understanding of the neuroscience behind that. Now, that, that if you could adapt that in a way that you could make it visual, um, perhaps have a model of the brain and show adolescents what's happening there. And, and, and whenever I think about um, that, it, it, I, I envision a, a road, uh, a dirt road that over time it develops ruts in it because of, of the, the travel over it. And so I always think of that when I think of how, uh, how addictions in general can become ingrained or primed within adolescence as we develop ruts in those neural pathways. So um, you know, thinking of, of word pictures like that and perhaps using you know, models of, of brains um, to share with, with youth could be helpful for them to, to make it a little more concrete about what's going on when they uh, use nicotine products. And then this person was again asking about the YouTube training videos. Um, we'll go ahead and get those posted up at keepitsacred.org. Um, this person says, do you have any presence in Los Angeles, California? They said that they work for the American Lung Association in tobacco control and that they're also an Air Force Guardsman. And we work with underserved populations in L.A. County. We would like to find out more about joining work groups or collaborating to serve our communities. Um, currently, we don't have any activities in uh, the greater Los Angeles area, uh, although we do have um, some representation from a group of people that are stationed in that area. So I'd encourage you to send Commander Lee and I an email and um, we'll we'll make some connections and and see how we can support you. Um, this person asks, uh, how do you handle the use of traditional tobacco? Well, from, from our standpoint, uh, we want to highlight traditional tobacco is, is actually prevention as a, as a tool for prevention and treatment uh, for the use of commercial tobacco. In other words, the, the, the more people understand the role of traditional tobacco within the life of American Indians and Alaskan Native uh, communities, uh, the research has shown that that's actually been a, a means to reduce tobacco use. And so uh, our, our, our push is to increase the awareness of the appropriate use of of traditional or ceremonial tobacco in the lives of Native Americans and highlight or contrast the difference between that and commercial tobacco use as, as a means of equipping people and, and a form of treatment and prevention. And this person says, which CDC report did you pull the targeted intervention and culturally informed strategies quotes from, from your early slides? I will send that link in to you, Mike, so that can get posted. But that was a, a morbidity and mortality weekly report that came out in, I believe it was December, but uh, I will get that exact citation and, and send that to you so that that can be shared. And this person says, um, is there a certified specific training for traditional tobacco use for natives? Um, is there something that you might happen to know of? So uh, the training resources in that vein that I'm aware of is that uh, University of Arizona's Basic Skills for Native Communities does uh, have an entire module that covers uh, traditional or ceremonial tobacco use as part of a part of that 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 four-hour training that they offer, and so uh, to 
to date, that's the only uh, evidence-based training that I'm aware of that also incorporates a component to equip providers to understand traditional or ceremonial tobacco use. And uh, finally, this person says, um, what are some culturally appropriate messaging for e-cigarette users? Well, uh, again, I'm not an expert on cultural messaging, um, but I would certainly encourage anyone who's got experience in developing that and, and highlighting the fact that it, the question uh, is, is addiction of any kind compatible with traditional Native American teachings. And then if it's not, then highlight the fact that nicotine is an addictive substance and when you're using e-cigarettes, uh, you have the potential to become addicted to them and therefore then that activity could become inconsistent or incompatible with Native American teachings. But I, I would welcome any uh, additional comments in that regard because I by no means hold myself up uh, as an expert on uh, the ideal messaging of that. All righty. And with that, we're going to go ahead and wrap things up. We're already about six minutes over time here. So we want to uh, thank Commander Verdugo for his uh, time with us today. And for additional information, feel free to visit our website at keepitsacred.org. And feel free to follow us on our social media platforms. We will be posting out the direct link to Commander Verdugo's uh, presentation and resources um, on our social media platforms within the next 24 hours. Um, most likely, it'll probably be within the next half hour or so. And uh, we'll go ahead and get, um, get that all posted up for everybody. If anybody has any questions for uh, Commander Verdugo, um, Go ahead and uh, send them an email at the email address on the screen there. And uh, with that, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. And we uh, do want to encourage folks to uh, complete the uh, post-webinar survey that will be sent out tomorrow, uh, around this time tomorrow. Get that completed, and then we'll go ahead and uh, send the um, certificates out for everybody who has participated in the webinar today. And with that, we'll wrap it up and we'll say thank you very much for attending today's webinar. Have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.